It's now my pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker. Uh, it's almost inconceivable that you don't know John, but for those of you who don't, John has been a faculty member in PA since 1976. Uh, he got his doctoral education at USC in Southern California after service with the Army and the Central Intelligence Agency. Uh, John has a remarkable relationship with our alumni. He is frequently invited to work with local government officials throughout the United States. In addition to his academic accomplishments, John uh, practices what he preaches and served on the Lawrence City Council for eight years, including two terms as mayor. John has chaired the, he, uh, those of you who drive around downtown notice that there's a beautiful new library under construction. Uh, John chaired the Board of Trustees for the Public Library and is currently the board president of the Willow Domestic Violence Center. John's research interests focus on contemporary trends in local government and the relationships between politics and administration. Uh, but all you really need to know about John is how beloved he is by his <coughs> colleagues, both within and beyond KU, and those generations of Kuzumats who have come to age under John's wisdom and guidance. There's a persistent rumor out there that John is retiring. And that's true, but only on paper. The reality is that John will remain very much an active presence at the school, both as a highly regarded emeritus scholar, and more importantly, in his ongoing role as classroom professor and guiding force for our intern option students. That's worth the cheer up for the So please join me in welcoming Professor John Nalbandian, who will speak to political astuteness, bridging the gap between politics and administration. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you all. Thank you, Charles. How's this sound okay for you guys? Okay, good. Um, I'm going to um, uh, change the title around a little bit, still talk about the same, <coughs> still talk about the same kinds of things. It's uh, what I'm most interested in um, these days, contemporary trends. Um, and these trends are not, I think, that you are going to find in um, your common conversation about fiscal this or planning this or whatever. These are a little more conceptual, but I think they have genuine um, practical consequences down the line. The, tr the, um, the leadership challenges uh, that I'm going to talk about are to me very interesting because when people say to me, well, what should we be doing about this? I say, just look in the mirror because you know that better than I do. Um, you know, generally speaking, what we as faculty do is we document what you're doing. Uh, we don't invent what you should do. <laughs> and, and so uh, we're at a stage, I think, in some of these leadership challenges where I'm trying to keep my eyes and ears open to see what's going on out there and to see how best uh, you all are responding to the challenges. Uh, Charles, thank you for the introduction. KCM, thank you for the, for the introduction. So traditionally, we've, um, we've tried to view uh, politics and administration as separate spheres of activity, separate ways of thinking about things. And uh, I think that made a lot of sense when we were trying to combat corruption and it was very important to separate inappropriate political uh, activity from the integrity of uh, administration when we were really trying to build um, the sense of something special about administrative work. Um, but I think what we need to realize is that it, with any significant, any significant policy or decision, anything that gets done has to combine um, what is politically acceptable with what is administratively feasible. So I'm going to say that again, that even though traditionally we've talked about the separation of the spheres, in actuality nothing gets done unless the spheres are connected in some, in some way. City managers um, and the city man pr pr management profession, no matter how far back you go, have always worked the territory that bridges the arenas of politics and administration. And today, I think that's more important than ever because there's a growing distance between the two spheres of activity. And I'll tell you a little bit about why 
that is happening, and I'll show you a, a, a graph of, as well. I view the space between administrative and political spheres, again, as a gap. A gap between what's politically acceptable and administratively feasible. So the main, the main, the, the, the essential, and you know, I used to say a, pr a prerequisite of effective governance is, is, is bridging the gap. And Bob O'Neill, the executive director of ICMA, and he said to me one time, it's not a prerequisite, it is not a prerequisite, it is the essential prerequisite. This must be, this must be done. So don't forget, nothing significant happens uh, without uh, bridging the gap. So let's, let's check out the first slide, which will show you where, where I'm headed. So we have political acceptability, administrative sustainability. We have the gap. The gap yields leadership challenges. And I think this is important to realize that uh, the gap has always existed. So I, I got another comeuppance uh, a while ago because I used to say um, close, uh, 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 close the gap. Our goal is to close the gap. And someone told me, I said, you never close the gap. The gap can never be closed. You need to metaphorically, you need to build a bridge. And you'll be able to walk back and forth and different people on the bridge, and it's a wonderful, wonderful metaphor. But the wider, the longer the bridge is, <laughs> all right, the more territory that you have to walk, the more new leadership challenges emerge. And so the three leadership challenges have to do with building, br uh, bi bridge building, roles and responsibilities, networked problem-solving structures, and engagement processes. Now note what I've done here with the three, with the three uh, challenges. Roles and responsibilities, structures, and processes. What could be more fundamental? See, nothing is more fundamental than, think, than talking about roles and responsibilities, structures, and processes. That's how fundamental I think that these um, that these uh, challenges are. Okay, so let's talk about this example. So take a look at this slide. All right, and let's assume that the question is how to reduce costs in the Postal Service. And let's further assume that there are two alternatives that will accomplish the goal. In other words, two alternatives that are uh, administratively sustainable. We can close post offices that are um, not very active and we know where those are, okay. Or we can, um, uh, uh, we can uh, curtail Saturday delivery. Which of those two is more politically acceptable? Why is it so, I'm gonna walk for a minute. I'll, I'll yell because you can't hear me. Why is, it, why is it so difficult to close post offices? Where, do those, where does that happen? The closure of a post office in a very small community is loss of their identity as a community. Nothing more needs to be said. <laughs> okay? All right? If you understand that politics at its root in this day and age is about issues of identity, you will have a conceptual scheme to understand an awful lot about what is going on and why this gap is growing. So the politics of identity, who we were, what our heritage is, what those fundamental values that we live by are, who we are now, and what we will become, are central notions of politics, and particularly the politics of identity. So if I say to you, the next time I run for office, my political campaign is, I pledge to you, the voters of Lawrence, Kansas, and Douglas County, that what I will do with your assistance, I will honor the past, we will capture the present, and we will shape the future. How do you like that? <laughs> Got it? Do I have your vote? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, 
That actually is the slogan of the KU libraries. Mm -hmm. But it's not copyrighted. I checked that. So what is the consequences? What are the consequences of failing to bridge the gap? See, this is this is this this is the important a very important piece. And the consequence is the failure to solve problems by definition. If we can't bridge the gap, what it means is we aren't making the connection, which means we aren't doing the important things that we need to do. And so what happens, the result is loss of confidence that people have in the governing institutions, loss of trust, loss of respect, and the worst of all, the loss potentially of the sense of legitimacy of the institution itself. So when you say to someone in a foreign country, a uh, foreign country, when you say to somebody in a country other than America, okay, um, American democracy is right on, <laughs> and they go, uh, in, the, in the not too distant fast past, you nearly defaulted twice on your debt because you couldn't agree on what you ought to do. And two, your legislative body has a 13% approval rating. Why are you holding yourself out as a model for the rest of the world? Whoa. You don't hear that in America, do you? <laughs> but you see, I mean, see, though there are those, those questions of legitimacy and trust. And think of all of the activities that you engage in that require trust and respect and when that diminishes how, how much of a bigger challenge that you have. So bridging this gap is very, very, uh, very important. Okay, so here's a slide that captures the gap. And what I have here is two dimensions on this, two, two uh, axes. This is the first axis uh, goes from a time, is time, and we have now and we have then. I have no idea when then was, but I know it was before now, okay? <laughs> and then we have learning. And the learning that I'm talking about is accumulated learning. So it's not learning, you know, in one year. It's learning over, and, and what I'm looking for is learning over time, okay? And so what the, what the, what the learning curve says is, over time, how much learning has occurred? And the argument, my argument is that uh, we don't know much more and we are not much better at being able to do politics today than we were yesterday. In contrast to that, we are much better able today to do administrative work, okay? Now, that has more to do than anything else. It has more to do with the tools that are available to you, okay? So can you imagine doing budgets without Excel? See, it's almost inconceivable unless, you know, you were back then and you remembered when you actually used a calculator or something like that. But the notion that you're able to use Excel with budgets, it's not just that it's faster. It enables you to deal with more data. It enables you to ask questions that you could not ask uh, previously, okay? So the difference between these two uh, uh, learning curves is reflected in the notion of political acceptability and administrative sustainability. This is an old slide, so it's got feasibility in there. And note that I give credit to John Arnold for this, because he helped me on the, uh, he gave me the idea in the very, uh, very beginning. Uh, so what we have is, um, on, the, uh, on the administrative side, and the reason why the gap is growing, is because on the administrative side, the mindset the mindset is, 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 is very, um, it's kind of flexible, it's, it's um, uh, experimental, it's um, an openness to trying new things because your world 
is changing so quickly, okay? And I'm talking internationally here as well as just within the United States, all right? So for example, uh, when you talk about technology and technological developments that you have to keep up with, see, you don't have a choice. You have to keep up with the technological developments. You have to learn how to deal with big data. You may not now, but it will, you will have to do that at some, at some, at some, at some point. Um, in addition, I know this world is in flux because we have labels for things that we can't really define, like sustainability and diversity. I mean, they mean so many different things, and that's just, that's a, that's, that's a symbol, that's an indicator that that world is in flux. See, where we can't, we've, we've got a label, but we can't all agree on exactly what that is. But very, very importantly, on the administrative side of things, what you have that elected officials don't have is you have systematic ways of conveying knowledge from one generation to the next. An engineer goes to engineering school, okay? And that engineer learns from other engineers, right? And one generation's knowledge is passed to another. And standards are, are, are developed. Ethical processes are developed, and so on and so forth. And this goes over, o over time. You know, I had a really interesting experience uh, last week. I drove down to uh, Austin because they had an executive uh, program at the University of Texas that I was involved in. And um, I had, it was just fascinating because I spent part of my time driving interstates, but then I spent part of my time driving uh, state and federal highways. So at El Dorado, I, I, I found my way to 77. Does that make sense? And I went down to Stillwater. What an absolutely wonderful drive that was. It was absolutely fascinating, you know? And then I got back on the interstate and it was like this shock. And the reason why it was a shock, and I don't know at my age why I'm surprised at this, but did you know that every single interstate was designed by one person? Now that's not true, but if you drive an interstate, that's what you would think. <laughs> <laughs> what color are the signs? Green. Green. I bet some of you could even tell me what font is used <laughs> and what size of the font and there's no sharp curves and there's probably an acceptable design speed and a maintenance schedule and so on and so forth. And see, that's the world of administration. See, that's, that, that's the learning from one generation to the, to the next, okay? So how many of you think that today's, your elected officials today are substantially better, do better work than the elected officials of yesterday? See, there may be a few, but you know, I would put, Dave can, and, and Craig could challenge me on, on this, but I would put the city councils that I was a part of in the 90s up against city councils of today and say, look it, we could have done just as good a job as they're doing today. There, there, there really are not any substantially different tools today than yesterday to help us make choices among conflicting values which is what politics is about. You know, I don't think we're any better off today in knowing how to decide whether or not efficiency or individual rights should prevail in any single decision. We have to do politics, okay? Now, the interesting thing is, do today's politicians benefit from the experiences of yesterday's politicians? Do they talk to each other? Is there a systematic way of transferring knowledge from one generation of elected officials to the next? No. I mean, if you go to NLC or you know a, a league meeting uh, here, you may learn you may learn a little something, but there is no systematic way. In fact, politics is the only job that I can think of where people think experience doesn't count. Now think about it all the jobs you've had, and do you just go, oh, I don't need any experience here. No, nah, no, it doesn't make any difference, you know, okay? So what happens is uh, this, this gap then 
is growing and in large measure because you are becoming so much better at the work at the work that you that you do so um, what we have then are three challenges the roles and responsibilities the structures and the processes so the first challenge is the first challenge is um, how to reinforce, create the bridge building roles and problem solving approaches, and here's the kicker, without becoming politically aligned or administratively compromised. And that's the challenge, okay? Um, I'm not gonna do this, this is where importance of political astuteness comes in, but that's another presentation, so I can't go into that, um, can't go into that today. But I want to show you this, uh, this uh, a graphic uh, that I worked up having to do with working the gap. And what I'm trying to argue here is the following. If the gap increases, the chief administrative officer, who always has been okay, involved in working in the gap, I mean, and this is why, see, and this is why, and see, the, there are no, there's no technical way of saying this is how you work in the gap. I mean, this is more talent. See, it's talent and it's, it's skill, but it's not a technical, it's not a technique that you can say, if you go to school and if you learn this, you will know how to do. This, this, is, this, is, a dyna this is the dynamic enterprise. And that's why I always caution younger people, be careful about when you take your first city manager job. Because if you haven't been able to see someone like Buchanan or Wynog, you know, work the gap, if you've never seen that, you're going to get in there and you're going to get swallowed up, man. <laughs> you know, you're going to get overwhelmed, okay? Because it is, it is it's something that you learn by experience. And so intuitively, I think what's happening is that city managers now are spending more time in the political arena, not being political politics, but just more, time, more sensitivity and more time with elected officials than their predecessors paid, played. Now, that's what, um, that's what this is trying to, trying to show, okay? And this is the, the gap, and I say it's the arena of power because anyone who can facilitate the connection is a powerful person. Anyone who can do that, all right? And um, as that gap increases, what it does is, it, metaphorically, it looks like an invitation. And all kinds of people enter the gap. And when I say all kinds of people, what I mean is, we have more nonprofits today than we ever had before. Because see, the gap is growing. We can't solve the problems and so other people enter in order to take a piece right all right and that's where the structural complications come in so as this however as the cao oh, well, i'm sorry as the cao moves in this direction what happens is this is just the way i think about it is that the traditional role of the chief administrative officer of 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 helping administrative staff understand the <coughs> politics, okay, understanding the idea of political acceptability, und helping, helping the staff, it ain't gonna work, I don't care, it doesn't matter, it ain't gonna work, we need to try something else, or try this little thing, and then going the other way too, okay, helping the elected officials understand what's going on down here and why this is important and so on and so on. That function doesn't go away. But the time that the chief administrative officer can spend on that function is less than it used to be. The function still has to be fulfilled. So guess who starts compensating? Guess who starts moving into the gap? The department heads. See, they have to start moving into the gap because the function needs to be fulfilled. That interplay needs to be fulfilled. Now, the best example that I have of that is the evolution in the job description of the police chief. It used to be, you correct me if I'm wrong, but it used to be 
that when you looked at a police chief, you said the police chief needs to run the police department. Can you imagine hiring a police chief today who couldn't do community work? Especially in a heterogeneous community? It doesn't make any sense whatsoever, okay? Now the question here though, the challenge is, are department heads ready for this? And how do you ready them for it? Do you build it into a job description? Do you select on that basis? Does it become part of a performance measure and a performance evaluation? And especially department heads who are not used to working in the political arena, how do you help them do that so that they don't become politically aligned? Because if they become politically aligned, then what happens is the other coalition or whatever on the council starts to dismiss what they have to say. The same time, if they become really effective at it, are they jeopardizing the confidence that administrative staff have in their integrity, in their professional integrity, okay? So this is the first challenge. So now let's go to the next challenge, which is what I call the structural challenge. And this is the realization <coughs> that problems extend beyond established boundaries that contributes to the gap. See, so any single, any single jurisdiction trying to solve a complex problem is going to have difficulty connecting what's politically acceptable and administratively sustainable because the problem exceeds the boundaries of authority. You don't have the authority to be able to connect the two. You can't even determine what's politically acceptable within your own jurisdiction. And what I've tried to do is just to give two examples. And one is water <coughs> policy affecting Western Kansas. Who has the authority to decide what water policy will be? I don't even know. But I guarantee you with all the, it, all the w my understanding about water rights and stuff, I mean, no single jurisdiction can say, oh, this is what we're going to do, and that will make a difference, right? I mean, it's more complicated than that. we got to get together, all right? On the other side of the state, okay, we have the metro area that's trying to do economic development with all these multiple jurisdictions, which only makes sense if you live in one of those jurisdictions, okay? So you live in one of the jurisdictions and you draw the boundaries around your jurisdiction, okay? And you say, okay, this is where we're doing economic development. Okay, that's the way you have defined the game. That is the way you have defined the boundaries that you're working in, right? Now, what if I tell you, I say, guess what? Your economy is going to be affected more by the region's economy than it is anything you do in your own jurisdiction. And guess what? You know where your competition is? Your competition is Omaha. Your competition is Oklahoma City. What are you doing? You should be dropping the boundaries and looking at this as a region rather than these, oh, but, but we can't do that, okay? Now, why can't we do that? Because the politics of identity. We are, so, we, we are so accepting of the politics of identity that even in metro areas, what we try to do is to create a distinct brand. Why would you try to create a distinct brand if in fact what you need to do is collaborate with your neighbors? You're not trying to differentiate yourself. What you're trying to do is say what you have in common. But this gets very complicated because in some cases, no, 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 we really do want to differentiate ourselves. But on other problems, we want the bigger, okay? So the challenge here, the, 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 the fundamental and most difficult challenge here is, the, is trying to create a mindset that says the problems that we are working on should determine 
the structure that we're utilizing to deal with it. Structure in our case, in part, meaning boundaries. Now, the way we deal with this commonly, okay, is we do things like we create the Mid-America Regional Council, or you create a, a council of governments in, in, another, in a, another way. You create a collaborative, some collaborative network, okay? See what all these things are? They, are? they are adaptations to the notion that there are structures that are fixed, okay? But there are problems that are wider than the individual structure, so now what we have to do is find a way to broaden the boundary, and we do that through the collaborative enterprise, okay, or, 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 some, other, or some other way. So these are, these are some of the uh, uh, considerations. Existing boundaries come into question. All right, now, this is a tough one. Is a very, very, very tough one. But think about this. With all of the changes that have occurred in local government since 2008, okay, how many boundary changes do you know about in jurisdictions? <laughs> oh, it never got that bad? Oh, don't tell Wall Street that. Don't tell my portfolio that, <laughs> okay? It did get that bad. But the politics of identity are so important and that when things get tough, issues of identity become more profound, okay? All right, so um, this last thing I wanna highlight too because this, our faculty member, Holly Gordell, she used this term managing boundaries as a leadership skill. See, when you're working the gap, the concept of managing boundaries, see, how many of you use that term to describe, oh, this is what I do. What do you do as a city manager? I manage boundaries. <laughs> <laughs> but that, it is what you do. See, and when you think about the internal organization, that, that's what you do internally, too, right? You say you two need to get to get the code enforcement thing. Okay, what, did, what, did you, what are you doing? You're, cha you see, you're changing the boundaries. Say, well, this and this, no, we want we want to do the boundary thing. And it's very challenging, very difficult, but what you guys did, this was in Wichita and Sedgwick County where they talked about code enforcement and some kind of <coughs> more than collaboration, but really kind of getting together as one, as, as, as one unit, okay? And it's taken, a it's, taken a long, it's taken a long time because of the identity that each, that each has with the, with the other. But managing boundaries becomes important. And what we need to understand, and I know this is complicated and it's just a thought, what we need to do is to understand when the boundaries need to be fixed and when we can drop the boundaries. And how do we create that mindset in, 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 in the picture that citizens have of the place we live. Do we really have a concept of the regional citizen? See, do, do we know what, what, what we expect from a regional citizen, a citizen of the region? See, I'm a citizen of my individual jurisdiction, but I'm a citizen of the region, and these are my expectations, and these are my obligations. We don't know that. We're in, that, we're, we're in that flux now. And the, and the last uh, challenge is the process challenge. Because of, because of all of the, of the entities that enter the gap in order to take a piece because the gap is increasing, we have some interesting possibilities. One is we can, we can talk and think more comprehensively about, about the problems. But there are no authoritative structures, meaning there is no single structure that can say, you will come to the table, okay? This will be the agenda. This is what we will do. And that's why this whole business about networks becomes very important. And it's why engagement becomes important. So it's not just engagement with individual citizens, but engagement with organizational entities. Right, coming together, and you know this because this happens. 
This happens in, in your jurisdiction. But I want to talk for a minute about, and, 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 and the goal here is a couple of things. One, assistance with problem solving. All right, so we gather people together in order to problem solve. But it, uh, it is also part of the goal is creating legitimacy for potential solutions because more people are there and buy in and so on and so forth. All right, now, here is my concern. My concern is that with all the technology, all the social media, all the avenues that we are creating, <laughs> all of the opportunity, not all of, but the preponderance of opportunities that we are, we are proposing for engagement are designed with the purpose of gathering information and of allowing citizens and other entities to express themselves, to express their views, as if that's been a problem. <laughs> Ask any elected official <laughs> if there was ever a problem in people telling him or her what they think, okay? But this is what we're doing. We're primarily, this is the way I see it, is creating, especially with the social media and so on and so forth, more opportunities for people to provide uh, their input on what they think about things. Now, what is the challenge there? The challenge there is the following. If we are going to do effective politics, if we are going to determine what's politically acceptable, if we are going to build and, and walk on the bridges, we have to be able to understand and we have to be able to work with four political values. Representation, efficiency, social equity, and what's the last one? Individual rights, okay? <laughs> all right, all right. So I'll say it again, okay? Representation, efficiency, equity, and individual rights. Now, when we do engagement, which value is that about primarily? Representation. See, getting, getting the, vo the voice. Getting the voice. Now, it could also be part of individual rights in the sense of giving people the right to speak. The problem there is that, that also the, m the more people understand that they have a right to speak, the more they think they also have a right to be listened to. <laughs> you don't have a right to be listened to. You have to earn the respect in order to have what you say listened to. Now, the reason why I get concerned is because the institutions that you work in, the government, not governance, the government institutions that you work in are constructed, are built, um, and are designed, and uh, the processes that we are utilized are designed, are, are work with the four values in mind. See, it's the government institutions that embody those values. If we can't incorporate the additional information into the institutions themselves, my fear is issues of equity. The greater good for the greater number may suffer. Issues of individual rights may suffer when we talk about land use and so on and so forth. And we create unrealistic expectations for citizens. <coughs> so that what I want to see in the engagement process is not as much emphasis as there is in allowing people to express their views. I want to see more forums where citizens have to confront the consequences of their views. Okay, I'll say it again. It's not so much the opportunity to express your views. What's missing is the requirement that you confront the consequences of your views. That's exactly what is supposed to happen on a city council. See, that's what a city council is about. We talk, we debate, we deliberate 
which means confront the consequences of our views. Okay, so that's the process challenge. So, and I put a website up here. If you, it, it, this is really, really good, and if you want to get a sense of engagement and the different ways of engaging, go to the website, look for the spectrum, um, and it talks about uh, five, different, five different ways of engaging, um, in, in, informing, consulting with citizens, involving citizens, collaborating with citizens, empowering citizens. The spectrum is very powerful because then it gives some expectations, obligations, and tools as well. Okay, so we talked about the process challenge. So here's the summary. The roles and responsibilities, administrative staff moving into the gap without <laughs> political alignment or administrative compromise. Developing the skills, the mindset, where the problems to be solved drive political administrative work and jurisdictional and or departmental boundaries adjust. And last, processes. Understanding that, I wrote an article a while ago that said, engagement is no longer optional. It is an imperative. It is an imperative because of the structural challenge. The, the networking that's required. The networking that's required makes the engagement process imperative to done for, for, for legitimacy. But I want to make those processes into decision-making approaches rather than just opportunities to gather, gather data and allow citizens to express their views. Okay, that's it in a nutshell. Thank you all very much. We have a few minutes for questions, but thank you all very much. Can we go over a little bit, do you think? Could that be all right? Just a little bit, maybe. Uh, uh, questions or comments? We'd be glad to, to take it, and then we'll, then we'll take a break. Mm -hmm. Thoughts? Yeah. And I guess this isn't a question <laughs> or a comment. It's an observation. But I, I don't disagree with your premise that uh, political skills aren't evolving at a rapid rate. But what we've noticed recently is while we have community engagement at a public forum or at a city commission mm -hmm. meeting, we have a commissioner Googling his rebuttal uh, while they're speaking and skewing information without doing fact checking. Yeah. And from a political process, it certainly changes the dialogue. Yes, very good. Thank you. Showing how complicated this all is in this day and age. Huh? Your thoughts, observations? Yeah, Carol? Well, I think you talked about the structures and the that political, that community identity is the reason that holds us back in crossing those boundaries. <coughs> but I think that identity created these structures of how money is allocated. And in my world, I think it's about money that creates that competition. Mm -hmm. And it's not as money about the economy of the community, it's the direct funds coming in to provide money for services. Yeah. And see, so, see, so what we have is, see, we have a tax structure, mm -hmm. right? See, that's built around a set of problems to be solved, mm -hmm. okay? And what we, I mean, theoretically what you would do is you would say, okay, how do we define the problems to be solved? Now let's create a tax <coughs> structure that but we're stuck with. And so, yeah, make, that's why it makes it so hard. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? John, I have a question. You, you know, I, I agree with you, <coughs> former elected also, that, that the, the capacities of elected aren't growing, but they're not supposed to. I mean, this is a democracy rather than a meritocracy, and so you have new people come up who, who by their very nature, lack those skills. So I wonder, when you're talking to elected officials, what, what do you tell them about their responsibility in terms of finding the gap? I tell them a couple of things. and. I've actually, you know, I don't have a hundred, I don't have as many experiences with elected officials as I, as I do with, with uh, opportunity to speak to professional staff. But, you know, I've done the workshops at National League of Cities and, uh, and, and other, other uh, forums for elected officials. And I'm confident enough to say that what, what they really connect with is the values. 
When I talk to them about the four values and the idea that politics, my definition of politics is a problem where after all the facts are known, we can still disagree over what we ought to do. We're now, we, we have, so how are we supposed to deal with that? Well, simple, you do politics. Well, what does that mean? What it means is you play with the four values. When I tell them about the four values, what it does is it helps them understand the work that they're doing. See, otherwise it's just, it's like the policy and the content, but they can't move to a level, a level, a conceptual level or the level of abstraction that really gives them, gives them that anchor, okay? So that's the single most important thing that I can do to help elected officials and put that, and that's what they, that's what they say. Now, the issue of politics and politics to be no, you know, no different and amateurs and so on and so forth, I go to your volatility thing, you know, the volatility. And the way I think of volatility in politics may be a little different. Um, because, you know, I think of politics as politics of identity. And the volatility there comes from the idea that the politics of identity is infused with emotion. And the volatility comes from the application or the infusion of the emotion into the process. Now, there's a nice little book, it's written by a Frenchman, where he talks about cultures uh, in the wor world cultures. And he says there's three different cultures in the world, three. Cultures of hope, cultures of fear, and cultures of humiliation. And he says the cultures of fear are the ones you have to watch out for. <laughs> because those are the ones that are driven by emotion. All right? So when you hear people say, the fundamental values upon which America was built are in jeopardy, they're not going to compromise. Why would they compromise? Politics has become a morality play. See, you do not compromise on issues of morality. And when you transfer the notion, when you transfer the notion of politics into the emotions that are connected to identity and you fear the loss of the anchors upon which the present and the future is built, that fear becomes a driving force. And the definition of politics that we grew up with, Charles, which is politics is the art of negotiation and compromise, is before the politics became the politics fundamentally of identity, I think. OK, last question. You, I, I can't quite word this, but term limits. Yes. And the effect on that gap. Right. And the effect on democracy of not allowing people to yeah. re-elect people that they want to re-elect yeah. because of term limits. Yeah. Both term limits, which, which affects the notion of that experience doesn't count, okay? Uh, but the second piece to that is um, the uh, number of jurisdictions compared to the past that are elected, electing councillors by district. And that, I am told, really complicates issues, uh, complicates issues as well. Okay, thank you all very much. I think we're gonna have a break now. <laughs>